Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress. I'm your host for the next hour. I'm currently reading one of the most powerful books in my library. It's entitled The Papacy and the Civil Power by Richard Wigington Thompson, R.W. Thompson, one time Secretary of the U.S. Navy, writing this book in 1876. And he is embarking in, on this, in this portion of the chapter in one of the most eloquent segments of this book where he juxtaposes the papal, monarchical, tyrannical system of government where the Pope rules supreme over, over the people with our Protestant form of government where the people are the power behind government, and that government rules at the behest of the people and not the Pope. Again, one of the most powerful and eloquent segments of this entire book, and I hope you'll pay close attention, and I'll do my best to do justice to this author as I continue to read where we left off last time. The reason assigned for the preference of the Catholic system over the Protestant is the incapacity of the people to govern themselves and to take care of their own civil affairs, an argument as old as tyranny. The Baltimore Council tells us that by recognizing, as we do in this country, an authority to govern which has no warrant for its character as divine and no limits in its application, the nation is exposed to disorder and anarchy. That's right. The Roman Catholic system considers our free Protestant system to be anarchy, to be disorder, and it has no divine right for its existence. And it says, and the concession to the Roman Catholic hierarchy of the right to separate their property from, from the mass of that belonging to other churches and people and to govern it by their own laws and by the canons of, the, of, the, of Rome, the canon laws of Rome, is demanded upon that express ground. So Rome justifies that her land and property in this country ought to be completely separate from this quote-unquote rebellious free system. It ought to be under an entirely different form of government. It ought to be un under the papal form of government. It ought to be untouchable by the government of the United States. In other words, the papacy demands to have a nation within this nation, a sovereign papal enclave within this nation that is untouchable by our government. Now he says, with these prelates, Protestantism thus tends to disruption of the whole social fabric because it confers upon each individual the right to decide what shall be the form of his religious belief, or whether he shall have any, and conducts all civil affairs without referring it to the Pope or his ecclesiastics or to any church authorities whatever to decide what laws shall be obeyed and what resisted. The issue is a plain one, easily perceptible to the most ordinary comprehension. The two systems, the papal system and the Protestant system, stand in direct antagonism to each other. The Protestant has separated the, the state from the church. The papal system proposes to unite them once again. The Protestant has founded its civil institutions upon the will of the people. The papal proposes to re reconstruct and found, and found them upon the will of the Pope. The Protestant secures religious freedom. The papal requires that every man shall give up his conscience to the keeping of ecclesiastical superiors. 
the Protestant develops the faculties of the mind by inciting the spirit of personal independence and manhood. The papal crushes out all this spirit by its debasing doctrine of passive obedience and submission. The Protestant has put the world upon a career of progress and prosperity. The papal system desires to arrest this career and turn it back into those old grooves which have led so many nations to wreck and desolation. The issue is made between these two systems in so bold a manner and uh, so bold and manly a matter a manner, excuse me, let me start over. The issue is made between these systems in so bold and manly a manner that its authors are entitled to that consideration which the possession of high moral courage always excites in generous minds. They can, therefore, have no just cause to complain of either intolerance or persecution if, finding ourselves in possession of free and popular institutions, which we have solemnly declared to be inalienable, we shall employ like courage in their defense, or even if, in maintaining their integrity, it shall become necessary to point out the contrast, the contrast between these opposing systems to the extent of showing that the Protestant and popular system was necessary to lift the world out of the corruption and degradation into which the papacy had plunged it. If it is a species of hallucination to suppose that such institutions as we possess are better suited to our condition than any that the Pope, as the King of Rome, or any of his ecclesiastical subordinates, or any ecclesiastical tribunal whatever, would be likely to substitute for them, we are not yet quite prepared to see it dispelled. If we abhor kingly or papal imperialism, or imperialism in any of its varieties of forms, and cling to institutions established in the face and in defiance of it, we should be unfaithful to our convictions and unworthy our position among the nations if we did not rebuke in fit and indignant terms any attempt by whomsoever made to fetter us with its chains or to plant its iron heel upon our necks. We must be stone blind who does uh, he must be stone blind who does not see in the light of these and other facts occurring almost daily that Protestantism has been formally arraigned by its vindictive and unrelenting enemy, Romanism, that it has put upon its trial before the civilized world, that judgment of condemnation has already been pronounced against it, and that the arm of the executioner is only stayed until the limbs of the victim can be so tightly bound as to make its resistance unavailing. Its open adversary and accuser is the papacy, which, unwilling to submit to the, necess uh, the necessity that has wrought out its own defeat among those who are most familiar with its enormities and, enormities and oppressions, he's talking about the Roman Catholic nations of Europe who overthrew the temporal sword of the papacy and, and developed their own republican forms of government, he continues, he said, now assails it courageously, but impud impudently in the citadel of its greatest strength. Right there in the very heart of Italy, right in the shadow of the walls of the papacy itself, Italy threw off the temporal sword of the papacy and established its own free republican form of government. Italy. At the time of this writing, Italy was rebelling against the papacy. They were showing the whole world the way to go. And here in America, the people were kowtowing to the papacy. Here in Protestant America, 
the enlightened nation of the world with the Bible in one hand and the gun in the other were making bacon with the papacy. And R.W. Thompson is rightly condemning of it. And the influence of the papacy is so much greater today than it was then. One has to wonder where on earth are the Protestants in, the, in America today? He continues, The loss of his imperial crown in Rome, his temporal sword, that's what he's talking about, the loss of his imperial crown in Rome has dispelled the joy of Pope Pius IX and driven him into a frenzy of excitement and passion and availing himself of the license afforded by the tolerant spirit of American laws and institutions, he is rapidly transferring his best drilled and disciplined militia to the United States and claiming to be clothed in the robes and with the authority of divinity. He demands in the name of deity that we shall bow down before him in passive submission and accept his commands as if uttered by a voice from heaven. And before I even continue, he says here of Pope Pius IX, who wrote the encyclical and syllabus of error, to which this council at Baltimore is affirmatively replying that he had dispatched his well-drilled and disciplined militia to the United States. And who was he talking about? In a note here at the bottom of the page, it says, When Pope Pius VII reestablished Jesuits after their suppression by Pope Clement XIV, he called them the sacred militia of the Pope. And here is a direct reference of Pope Pius IX, the writer of the encyclical and syllabus of error, who damned our Protestant ways, our Protestant constitution and institutions in this nation. He damned freedom of conscience. He damned freedom of religion. He damned a government of, by, and for the people and, and dictated that the only righteous government in the world is one centered in God and the Pope is the representative of God on this world. In other words, there is no rightful government in this world unless it is created, controlled by the papacy, by divine right. And he sent his Jesuits to this country for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to overthrow the Protestant form of government. Our Constitutional Republic and Bill of Rights, to destroy that Constitution and put in its place a papal government. And that's precisely what has happened in the United States today. In the full face of Protestants, and there's been no protest, Protestantism barely deserves the name Protestant anymore. And what happens when papal tyranny gains the upper hand? All opposition is put down by whatever means available, including the flame and the faggot. And that's precisely what's going to happen in this country, because we fail to heed the wise words of Richard Wigington Thompson in 1876, and there's barely no one in this country anymore quoting him, and educating the people. There's coming an inquisition to this once Protestant land because we failed to maintain the liberty with which Christ has made us free. R.W. Thompson continues, he says, we who believe that Protestantism is sheltered by divine care must not remain unresisting under an attack so immediate and formidable, nor sit still while a judgment may be taken by default against us. By default. 
Now, how could that judgment by default be taken? No resistance. And there's no resistance in this country of, of a papal overthrow. No open, nobody's willing to openly de, de point the finger at Rome and say, you are a papist. You occupy your seat in Washington, D.C. You occupy your seat in the Senate and the Congress for one purpose and one purpose only, to overthrow our free Protestant institution and replace them with the God of your belief, the Pope of Rome, to replace them with papal tyranny. And you've got no right to occupy any seat in the government in this free land so long as you pay your homage and your worship and your obedience to a sinner in Rome who demands by divine right to rule top-down, to turn topsy-turvy this government created of, by, and for the people. There ought not be one Roman Catholic in government in this country. We fail to understand the basics of what R.W. Thompson is speaking of today. He says a, a commanding sense of duty requires that we should look this haughty and imperious adversary full in the face, understand his machinations, Strip him of his disguises, unravel his plots, and meet him at every point of attack. If we shall remain insensible to any of the obligations of this duty, now that the battle cry is sounding in our ears, it may be too late after the storming party has mounted the walls of our fortresses, pulled down our flag, and planted that of papal and ecclesiastical absolutism upon the grave of popular institutions. What does Protestantism mean? What necessity gave it birth? What has it done for mankind? What would be the condition of the world if it were destroyed? These are the questions we should not fear to discuss, and which we are bound to discuss now that it is denounced in our very faces as heresy and infidelity by the papacy. And we are insolently told that duty to both God and man requires its total extermination and the erection of a quote-unquote holy empire wheresoever its principles prevail and its institutions exist. We must not sink into indifference, nor permit the fear of consequences to slacken our exertions in a cause of such transcendent importance to ourselves and to our children. If our fathers had been easily intimidated, we should have had no such government as we now possess. If we shall prove less courageous than they the heritage they have left to us may not pass to many generations of our descendants. Some of the proudest governments on earth have already fallen. There are none that may not fall. This is not called a Protestant country because religion, in the Protestant sense, is established by law or has any protection against it which is, is not equally extended to all other forms of religion, Roman Catholic, Jewish, Mohammedan, Brahmanin, Brahminical, Greek, or Chinese. No such preference could be conferred by law under our system of government, for it would be so essentially and flagrantly violate its fundamental principles that it would be instantaneously destroyed. By these principles upon which the whole superstructure has been reared, every citizen, no matter, where they're, no matter whether native-born or naturalized, is fully and equally protected in the personal and individual right to maintain, in private or public, 
whatsoever religious faith, and to practice whatsoever form of religious worship his own conscience shall approve, no matter what degree of absurdity it may involve. No reasonable man should desire, desire a higher degree of religious liberty than this. It gives to our form of government a distinguishing characteristic found nowhere else in so imminent a degree until the people of the United States entered upon the experiment of self-government. It stamps our institutions with their Protestant character and distinguishes them in a conspicuous degree from such as have existed on those countries known as Roman Catholic, where no such toleration and liberality have ever existed, and no such experiment has even been tried. No intelligent reader needs to be told that the religious controversies of Europe gave rise to the term Protestant. In its original application to these controversies, it had a, dis a, dis a distinct religious meaning as at the Diet of Spires in 1529. But as they were of long continuance through, the subsequent, uh, through and subsequent to the great reformation of the 16th century, and Protestants were compelled to concert some measures of escape from the oppression and persecutions which arose out of the union of church and state under the papal system and the, and the consequent and the consequent claim of divine right of kings to govern the world, it acquired in the course of time a different and more comprehensive signification. Protestant Christianity was understood to involve the right to protest against the corruptions and the exactions of the Roman Catholic Church, to withdraw from communion with it, and to, sub and to worship God in other forms than those prescribed by its discipline. It encountered, therefore, from that church, the Roman Catholic Church and its ecclesiastical authorities, then almost supreme over the Christian world, such opposition as it found itself without power to resist, unless it could find shelter somewhere under the protection of law. What is he talking about? Roman Catholicism would have been destroyed in Europe except for the fact that Roman Catholicism found the liberty necessary to maintain itself right here in our free country, USA. R.W. Thompson has just described the United States of America as being the only refuge left on earth for the papacy. Isn't it extraordinary? And R.W. Thompson further says this is where Roman Catholicism is going to get her do-over. And I'm telling you, the end game for that do-over is total world government. Not just here in the United States, but that the papacy is going to cloak her global efforts behind Protestant USA. It has happened since the founding of this nation. It continues today few recognize what the role the United States of America has played in putting the papacy back on its tyrannical throne. RW, let's, let's retrace the last few sentences before the break, and I'll add further points and corrections. He says, Protestant Christianity was understood to involve the right to protest against the corruptions and exactions of the Roman Catholic Church, to withdraw from communion with it, and to worship God in other forms than those prescribed by its discipline. It encountered, therefore, from the Roman Catholic Church and its ecclesiastical authorities, then almost supreme over the Christian world, such opposition as it found itself 
Protestantism found itself without power to resist unless it could find shelter somewhere under the protection of law. Now, in another place in this chapter, uh, R.W. Thompson, and, and, and so far throughout the book, R.W. Thompson has told us that the papacy found refuge here. But we we're tracing the Protestant Reformation and its movement from Europe to get away from papal tyranny to come here where it could be protected under law. Now, this was obtained to some extent after severe and protracted struggles under the laws of Great Britain, Germany, and Holland. And yet, even in those comparatively free, country, uh, free countries, thought had many difficulties and impediments to overcome before it could require perfect freedom, before it could acquire perfect freedom. Its only formidable adversary during all its struggles was the papacy, which was ever ready to plunge the pontifical sword to the heart of its victims. Okay, the lethal enemy of free thought, of Protestantism, of that right to disassociate with the Roman Catholic Church is the papacy itself. The mortal enemy of Protestantism is Catholicism. And likewise, the, the Catholic Church views its mortal enemy as Protestantism. If the Pope claims divine right, a right given to it by God to rule the world in his stead, Naturally, any power, any thought, any freedom that resists that power is a lethal force to the papacy. And Rome wielded her temporal sword with abandon. The Jesuits attacked Protestantism in every form in Europe. Religious persecution ran rampant. Inquisitions, holocausts, on and on and on, ethnic cleansings. Anybody who wouldn't kowtow to the papacy, wouldn't come to Mass, wouldn't eat the Jesus cookie, was burned at the stake. Liberalism, Protestantism, free-thinking, Bible Christianity. Let me just be specific. Bible Christianity couldn't survive when papal tyranny ruled, and they, they came to this country and declared religious freedom and put provisions in the Constitution that made it virtually impossible for the papacy to exercise her tyrannical papal sword against Protestants. And nothing has changed. That's the point that that I would like to make. Nothing has changed. The only formidable adversary of Protestant Protestantism during all its struggles was the papacy, which was ever ready to plunge the pontifical sword to the heart of its victims. The original immigrants of the United States brought with them from Europe the principles of Protestantism, mingled somewhat with the less liberalizing principles of Romanism. And although for a while the effects of the habits of thought they had thus acquired were exhibited in the practices of religious intolerance, yes, early in our founding there was religious intolerance, some of that old papal uh, dogma, still had its fangs even in the minds of those calling themselves Protestants, and they resorted to religious persecution. Our history makes it clear. It says, And although for a while the effects of the habits of thought they had thus acquired were exhibited in the practice of religious intolerance, they united in the end, in the creation of a government entirely freed from this taint. They gave up their intolerance in order to secure the perfect triumph of Protestantism in its most comprehensive sense. And when our national and state governments were organized with the principles of toleration at their foundation, 
our civil institutions became also necessarily Protestant in form because they contain the ablest guarantees of both religious and civil freedom. The idea conveyed by the common expression, the Protestant religion, is generally misunderstood. Religion signifies a system of faith and worship, true or false according to the standpoint from which it is considered. To us, the Christian religion is true, while those of the Hindu, Chinese, and Turks are false. Nevertheless, the systems of faith and worship which prevail among the Hindus, the Chinese, and the Turks are only so many forms of religion. Protestantism is not a religion in this sense, for it recognizes no system of faith and worship to the exclusion of others. It is only another form of Christianity, distinct from those which existed in the world before its origin. And here's where I'd like to take a minor issue with uh, R.W. Thompson. I call Protestantism a return to apostolic Christianity. He calls it just another form of Christianity. I disagree. But be that as it may, we'll continue. He says, It is altogether proper, when speaking of the Church of England, to say the Protestant Episcopal Church, because at its, at, at its organization, after the Protestant Reformation, it assumed an attitude of open antagonism to the Church of Rome by protesting against its errors. But neither that nor any other churches which have originated since the Protestant Reformation can justly demand to be known as the Protestant Church. There are a number of Protestant churches, each representing its own form of Protestantism. Taken as a whole, they may be regarded as different developments of one and the same Protestant principle. Therefore, Protestantism, insofar as it has a religious aspect, represents all these churches. That is, Protestant Christianity is liberal and comprehensive enough to embrace them all. It goes even further than this and recognizes the Roman Catholic Church as a Christian church and its religion as only a different form of Christianity from itself. And this is where I get the hackles up and down my back and my neck. This is the great error of Protestantism. This is where we have left the wisdom of the Protestant reformers, this idea that Roman Catholicism is another form of Christianity. The Protestant Reformation, the reformers denounced the Roman Catholic Church as that synagogue of Satan. R.W. Thompson, as wise as he is, as eloquent as he is, as historically astute as he is, fails to recognize at this point what Protestantism really is. It is protestant of God's church against Satan's church, Satan's counterfeit. The great error of Protestantism today is to embrace the Roman Catholic cult as just another form of Christianity. This error is the basis of the, of the ecumenical movement. In a nutshell, this is the, the, the critical departure from the lessons learned by our Protestant forefathers and the downfall of Protestantism and the downfall of this country and from there the fall of the whole world because it allows the papacy to take its divine right position. This is the grievous, grievous error. He continues, he says, but Protestantism does not alone include Christianity and religion in these senses. It has other aspects. 
In its proper signification, it embraces the whole offspring of the Protestant Reformation. That is, all the principles, civil as well as religious, to which the Protestant Reformation gave birth. These principles have been at work upon both individual and governments ever since the Protestant Reformation, and such has been their influence that the countries of the Reformation are the theater of the greatest work of God which has taken place since the days of the apostles. That is true. And he said, the leading cause of the Reformation was a sudden effort made by the human mind to achieve its liberty, a great insurrection of human intelligence. It had to contend, therefore, against everything that put restraint upon liberty, whether found in church or state, so that Protestantism, in taking its distinctive form, became the principle out of which all the existing guarantees of religious and civil freedom sprung. It saved religion by separating it from the corruptions of the papacy and thus provided for the world a purer and better form of Christianity. It saved society by breaking the scepters of kings and popes and elevating the people to the point of asserting and maintaining their natural right to liberty. Consequently, Protestantism, by diffusing new thoughts, ideas, and principles, has so influenced individuals, societies, and governments that now in the 19th century, its results are seen in all the civil and religious institutions existing among Christian peoples. Wherever there are freedom of thought, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, they are ex they are exclusively of Protestant origin and growth. How eloquent. Can I read that again? Would you indulge me if I just read this again? Wherever there are freedom of thought, freedom of speech, and freedom of the press, they are exclusively of Protestant origin and growth. These involve no religious sentiments, but are mere civil rights. Yet they are rights which are included in Protestantism, because if it were destroyed, they would be also. Do you see? Can, can I just elaborate a little bit on what R.W. Thompson just said? He just said that if anything raises up in your face to challenge your freedom of speech, you might well suspect that it's Romanism that is doing it. Let me read it again. These involve no religious sentiments, but are civil rights. Yet they are rights which, included, which are included in Protestantism, because if it were destroyed, if freedom of speech freedom of the press, freedom of thought, freedom of religion were destroyed, Protestantism would be also. That's what he's saying. So anytime you see any of these Protestant liberties being attacked, and especially by our own government, you must immediately suspect that the papacy has raised up its controlling authority in Washington, D.C., and our government representatives are responding to the Pope and not to the people. And what is the eventual victim of this gradual but steady erosion of our Protestant principles? Common sense should dictate that Protestantism is the ultimate victim, the intended victim, the target of the papacy is Protestantism, and it attacks it by attacking its civil rights so that it cannot practice in the presence of the Roman Catholic Church. No religious freedom in Roman Catholicism. 
your civil rights begin and end with your right to be Catholic and to be Catholic without any competition from any other religion. That's the beginning and the ending of freedom in the Roman Catholic Church. It is diametrically opposed to Protestantism. And the author continues, And thus, the term Protestantism has a twofold signification, embracing whatsoever was grown out of the Protestant Reformation in both church and state. So it is regarded by the most distinguished authors who have endeavored to point out the philosophy of the Reformation. This is how it is, is, is regarded by those distinguished authors who have endeavored to point out the philosophy of the Reformation. Even the Roman Catholic Archbishop Spalding, who presided over this Baltimore Council, has entitled his greatest work, The History of the Protestant Reformation, and has devoted it to the discussion of the influence of Protestantism on society, on civil liberty, on literature, on civilization, as well as on the doctrinal belief, morals, and religious worship. He who does not comprehend Protestantism in all these aspects fails to comprehend its real meaning and will have poor conceptions of the differences between it and Romanism. There's the key. We've lost the distinction. We've lost the ability to comprehend the differences between Protestantism and Catholicism because we've, we've just lost our Protestant roots. This Archbishop Spalding wrote a book outlining the history of Protestant Reformation. We could take a lesson from this Archbishop and restore our Protestant heritage. Another Protestant Reformation. And the second one would be just like the first. We would see, by nature, our first and most lethal enemy in the papacy, as did the Protestant Reformers. But today we fail to see the difference between Protestantism and Romanism. Else how would the ecumenical movement be so successful? The author continues, this is, he says, if there were but a single difference consisting in merely in matters of religious faith, the field of controversy between them would be greatly narrowed and would be occupied alone by the theologians. But they are, in fact, two opposing systems, as the statement of the Baltimore Council. And this opposition is no less in government than in religion. What R.W. Thompson has just told you, the papal system and Protestantism cannot exist together in peace. And Rome has said so. Pope Pius IX said so. This Baltimore Council said so. The Protestant reformers said so. It says, in the formation of their national and state constitutions, the American people designed to embody the means of preserving to themselves and their posterity all those fruits of the Protestant Reformation which were, are represented by Protestantism. They intended to give further development to its principles and surer guarantees for their preservations than they had before received. Hence, when we speak of this as a Protestant country, of our institutions as Protestant, and of ourselves as a Protestant people, we should be understood as conveying the idea that in the affairs of both church and state, we have chosen to abandon the old papal system and to establish one more in harmony with the genius of our people 
because it gives the best guarantee ever yet afforded to the world for perpetuating those great principles of the Protestant Reformation by means of which the minds of men become free and the shackles of civil tyranny were stricken from their limbs. Whether mankind has lost, uh, excuse me, whether mankind have lost or gained, or whether the world has moved backward or forward, under the influence of the institutions we have thus formed, are questions which with us have no discussion. We, at all events, cherish the belief and teach it to our children that under no other form of civil institutions found in the world are mankind so well protected in every just and proper right or made so capable of advancing their own happiness and prosperity as they are under ours. We confidently and somewhat proudly assert for our Protestant principles of government a superiority over those of the monarchical papal form and congratulate ourselves that mankind are, are gradually coming to the realization of the idea that only by means of them can civil and religious liberty be fully secured and preserved. Are we right or wrong in cherishing these opinions, in, opposing, in, in supposing that freedom is preferable to bondage, in maintaining that a government of the people is better than that of an emperor or a king or a pope or an ecclesiastical hierarchy, and that no privileged class are born into the world ready-booted and spurred to govern and debase mankind by divine right? Other governments besides ours have been founded on the popular will, on the right of the people, as the source of the civil power, to prescribe their own form of institutions. Before the Christian era, the Romans and the Spartans recognized the efficacy of the doctrine that the safety of the people is the supreme law. But they were unable to secure its establishment as a distinctive and permanent feature of their government because they failed to cultivate that sense of personality out of which grow the virtue and intelligence necessary for the support of popular institutions. Unfortunate, however, as their failure was for uh, uh, unfortunate, however, as their failure was for the world, the avowal of the principle gave rise to influences which were never entirely destroyed. The idea of government upon which they unsuccessfully experimented struggled along through succeeding centuries, even through the Middle Ages, awaiting a favorable opportunity for ultimate and complete development. It has always had many able and zealous defenders in the countries considered the most enlightened, but they have been kept down by the governing classes who employed the combined authority of church and state to intimidate and to subdue them. This combined influence was for a long time sufficient to hush almost every murmur of complaint against misgovernment except among the few who dared to defy it at the hazard of their lives. Now and then, one of these intrepid spirits appeared and flung his censures into the very teeth of royalty. And if he paid for his boldness by the forfeit of his life, others of like courage arose to take his place, and thus the line of patriotic succession was kept unbroken. They were few in number, but enough of them to keep the fires of liberty aflame, so that they might flash in the eyes of royalty. The world would, centuries ago, have been turned over entirely to the cruel and exacting taskmasters and sunk into utter political darkness, but for the bravery of these defenders of popular freedom. And I am so sorry to have run out of time, but i like to include my voice, Inquisition Update, in the short list of those who maintain religious and civil liberty as opposed to papal tyranny. And it's my honor and pleasure and privilege and blessing to utter it here.